Father Bob Warren of the Franciscan Friars of the Atonement. Thank you for listening to this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour radio show. The Friars' popular Ave Maria Hour was first brought to the radio airwaves in 1939, recorded in New York City and on the mountainside grounds at Graymoor, a home in Garrison, New York. These timeless classic stories of the Bible and the lives of the saints came to life each week through dramatic reenactment by professional actors and actresses. You know, friends, Christ once said, Do not hide your treasure under a bushel. In saying this, he meant share your gifts, share your talents. The Friars of the Atonement feel the message in these broadcasts remains as powerful and timely as when they were originally aired, and we are so happy to be able to share them with you today. To learn more about the missions and ministries of the Friars of the Atonement, I invite you to visit our website, www.atonementfriars.org. In the meantime, sit back and enjoy this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour. St. John Vianney. Probably the greatest confessor of all the priests in Catholic history was Francis St. John Vianney, Cure of R. This remarkable priest actually confessed more than a million souls during his lifetime. Yet this same cure was once barred from the priesthood because he could not pass the simplest seminary tests. How did he come to be history's greatest confessor? Some years after the fall of the Emperor Napoleon, the most unpromising priest in all France was assigned to the most unpromising parish. Good evening, mademoiselle. You are the new curé of Ars? Yes, mademoiselle. I presume you know who I am? You are the Chatelaine, mademoiselle de Garay, sister to the Marquis. Yes. It's courteous of you to come to pay your respects so soon. Times have changed. In years past, the Church of Ars was the chapel of the Marquis. The curé was the Marquis's chaplain. The village also belonged to the Marquis then. Now the Marquis, the church, the curé all belong to the village. Well, forgive me for contradicting you, Mademoiselle de Garay. The Marquis, the church, and the curé do not belong to the village. To whom then do they belong? To God. <laughs> Father John Vianney was possessed by a passionate desire to move the soul of every human being in the parish of Ar. He began with his own housekeeper. Madam, come out of the house, if you please. Father, I do not wish to be impertinent, but this is a very silly arrangement. What is? This idea of yours that you will never enter the house till I come out, and I must never go in the house if you are already there. You do not trust me alone in the same house with you. What am I, the devil? Oh, hush, madam. Do not mention the Grappen's name. He might think you are calling him. The what name? I call the evil one the Grappen, the Hook. He's always reaching out for souls. Well, I assure you, the Grappen has not the slightest chance of hooking my soul, merely because I happen to be inside the same house with you. Well, madam, I know that, but we must keep up the appearance of sanctity as well as its reality. It will help us save the souls of the people of Ar. Very well, father. You and I shall be like the dolls in a Swiss weather-predicting house. One cannot go in without the other coming out. What did you want of me now? Uh, do not come to work tomorrow. Why not? Tomorrow is Sunday, the Lord's Day. Now I understand. You intend to stop the whole parish from working on Sunday. Beginning with you, madame. Reforming the others won't be as easy as reforming me, I assure you. 
Oh, if I were alone in this endeavor, I would agree with you, madame. I am such a blockhead. Well, who else is with you in this reform? The Chatelaine Mademoiselle de Garay? Oh, someone much more influential. Not the Marquis himself. Someone much more influential. Oh, who can possibly be more influential than the Marquis? God, madame. God. <laughs> Good evening, Mademoiselle de Garay. Thank you for inviting me to the chateau. Father John, I want you to meet the mayor of R. Oh, yes, I believe we have already met. Uh, frankly, Monsieur le Curé, I wish we didn't have to meet tonight. You sound displeased, Monsieur. I'm not only displeased, Monsieur le Curé, I'm very unhappy. The whole village is unhappy, Father. Why? Listen to him, Mademoiselle de Garay. He asks why. The mayor is disturbed because of your preaching against working on Sunday. Why? Half the farmers in the parish are complaining to the mayor about your sermons. Since you began preaching that those who break the Lord's commandment to keep the Sabbath day holy will go to hell, their laborers are frightened. They refuse to work on Sunday. And the rest of the farmers are afraid their laborers will soon do the same. Well, I am very grateful to you, monsieur, for telling me this. You're going to correct the situation, monsieur le curé? With half of the parish still breaking the Lord's commandment, I must redouble my fervor in my sermons. We want you to listen to reason, Father. We did not call you here to encourage you to redouble your reform efforts. I am always willing to listen to reason, Mademoiselle de Garay. Exactly why did you call me here to the chateau? Well, we want you to correct the situation, not make it worse. By correcting the situation, I presume... You mean that I, a priest of God, should tell the people of ours that disobeying one of God's commandments is a permissible thing? Oh, that I cannot do, Mademoiselle de Garay. No one is asking you to preach disobedience of the commandments. You must believe that we too want to save our souls and the souls of all the villagers. Look, answer me this, if you will. When all the Pharisees in the Bible were enforcing the divine rule against working on the Sabbath... Who said plainly, man is greater than the Sabbath? Who advised the farmer to go down into the pit on a Sunday after his fallen sheep? Well, your argument is well put, Monsieur Mayor, but there was necessity involved in Jesus' case. Uh, and is not the loss of reaping of the village crops also a matter of necessity? Shall we all risk starvation because you will not obey Jesus' way of understanding his father's commandments? You mean that when necessity is involved, you expect me not to forbid work on the Sabbath? We mean it. Well, when it is necessary to work on a Sabbath in order to save food in the ground, I will not forbid the work. I will even urge that it be done. Uh, now you're preaching wisdom. But, of course, if it is not necessary to work to save food in the ground, you will be willing to keep the Sabbath holy according to the commandments. Well, naturally. Well, then you, being the owner of the village tavern will naturally be willing to close your tavern on Sunday. But, Monsieur le Curé, I... Is your tavern open on Sunday needed to bring food out of the ground? Well, not precisely. Good. Oh, then this very Sunday I shall tell our parish of your most generous sacrifice. Good evening, monsieur. Mademoiselle. Wait, Monsieur le Curé, Wait! <laughs> But the curé did not wait, and the village tavern began closing regularly on the Lord's Day. Mademoiselle de Garay was quite amused at the mayor's annoyance, but her turn to be annoyed was coming sooner than she expected. It is kind of you to receive me, Mademoiselle de Garay. You honor me by your visit, Father. What can I do for you? Well, you can do for me a great kindness, and for yourself win great grace in God's eyes. And what is this great kindness which will win grace for me in God's eyes? Well, you see, the villagers look up to you, Mademoiselle de Garay. They use you and your conduct as a, a model to imitate. So? So if you do what is right, the villagers will do what is right. But if you do what is wrong... And what am I doing that is wrong? What you are doing is not wrong in itself. But when the villagers imitate you, they, they do not imitate your prudence and your good taste. 
only my weakness? But what is this mysterious weakness which the villagers imitate in such a way as to, to cause you so much concern? Mademoiselle, I said nothing about your having personal weaknesses. Then what are we talking about, Father? Why are you here? To ask of you a favor. What favor? To discontinue your Saturday night parties. Why? Because there is dancing at your parties. Ah, oh, do you mean to tell me that you consider dancing a sin? Dancing itself is not a sin, but dancing leads to sin. Oh, Father, have you not seen the sedate sort of dancing we do at my parties? Why, I've, I've even heard that the bishop approves. Well, that may be so, mademoiselle, but no bishop would ever approve of the movements uh, when the villagers imitate you. Moreover, young men and young women wander away from the dancing place for hours at a time, unnoticed and unrebuked. But that does not mean that these people sin at the dance. Only God knows whether they sin or not. Oh, God knows all. But I know a small part also. How can you know? Am I not confessor to all in the village? And so I must give up my harmless little party? Well, if you give up your parties, your example will help me persuade the villagers to give up their dances. This reform will not make you the most popular person in our, Father John. Oh, God will not judge me by my popularity, but by the way I have done my duty as a priest. And you, mademoiselle, how do you want God to judge you? Certainly not as a woman who knowingly puts occasions of sin in the way of the villagers, Father John. Step by step, the cure's reforms changed our... All this was remarkable enough, but it was as a confessor that the curé of R soon gained unmatched influence that reached beyond his own parish. People from neighboring parishes began coming regularly to the R confessional. One neighboring priest became jealous and wrote Father John Gianni an uncharitable letter. Good morning, Monsieur Le Maire. Uh, good morning, Mademoiselle de Gary. It is most gracious of you to receive me so early in the day. Well, you said you had a delicate matter to discuss with me. I do. Well, then, please proceed. <clears throat> it concerns our curé. <laughs> Does anything happen in our that does not concern our curé these days? The mayor of the next village came to see me. About the curé of our? Mm, about our curé. And also his curé. His curé wants to make peace with our curé. Why, I did not even know that they'd quarreled. I would never have believed our curé capable of quarreling with anyone, except the devil. Oh, our curé never quarreled with the other one. Oh, but you said that... that... the other curé wants to make peace with our curé. But if they never quarreled, why does he want to make peace? Well, it, it began with so many people of the neighboring village coming to Ar to be confessed. Their curé was furious. He thought the curé of Ar should have discouraged the people. But Father John can't refuse the sacrament of confession to any penitent. True, but what will you have? Jealousy can blind even a good priest, Mademoiselle de Garry. In any event, our neighboring curé remembered the weakness of the curé of Ar on the subject of theology when they were both seminarians. Mm -hmm. And he wrote the curé of Ar a serious, rebuking letter about his unworthiness to confess people. Continue, monsieur. Did Father John reply to the rebuke? Uh, he, he did. I've been loaned his reply. Uh, may I read it to you? Oh, yes. Yes, please do. This is how the letter reads. Uh, most dear and most venerated confrere, what good reasons I have for loving you. You are the only person who really knows me. Since you're so good and kind to take an interest in my poor soul, do help me to obtain the favor I've been asking for a long time. That of being released from a post which I'm not worthy to hold by reason of my ignorance, what? so that I may be allowed to retire into a little corner there to weep over my poor life. Oh. What penances there are to be undertaken, how many expiations are to be offered, how many tears to be shed. What a touching letter. Makes me want to cry. Yeah. You see now why I asked to show you this letter. 
You want me to provide a neutral meeting place for the two priests? It uh, might save mutual embarrassment. The priest from the next village met the cure of R and was readily forgiven for his uncharitable letter. Five years after his arrival in R, the cure asked and received permission to move to another parish. He was astonished by the reaction of his parishioners when they heard the news. What? Mademoiselle de Garay. Father John. Monsieur. Monsieur le cure. I am here too, monsieur le cure. Well, why are you all here? Why, why do you all look so angry? Mainly because we are angry. What have we done to offend you, Father? That you should force the bishop to move you away from here. I, a mere priest, force the bishop to do anything? Why are you so eager to desert us, Father? I am not deserting you. I only want to help you. You want to help us by leaving our... But the priest who will replace me will be much better for you, my friend. If you are the best priest in France, how can another priest be better for us? Hush, woman, now that is a very wicked thing to Some say. Some of us think it is a wicked thing for you to want to leave us, Father. Well, to be frank with you, Mademoiselle de Garay, I am not particularly eager to leave ours. One place on earth is just like another. Nothing here belongs to us. We are all strangers on this planet. Ah, belongs to you in a special way, Monsieur le Curé. Now, please do not say such things. Such thoughts are sins. Ah, belongs only to God. If ah belongs only to God, why do you wish to leave a place which belongs only to God? Because people are beginning to say frightening things about me. They are true. You are a saint. That is enough now. Silence. You may force people's tongues to be silent out of respect for your wishes. But you cannot force people from thinking what you forbid them to say aloud. Whether you stay at our move to Salle, Monsieur le Curé, do you think that will change what people think about you? Or stop them coming to see you? After much pleading from his parishioners, the curé finally agreed to ask the bishop to reconsider and let him stay in R. The bishop consented. The years that followed brought to full fruition an amazing priestly career. For more than 30 years, St. John Vianney heard an average of 100 to 300 confessions every day of his life. Toward the end, special trains and buses ran to R, bringing thousands of penitents to the curé every year. His friends watched in wonder and praised God for the deeds of his saint of R. Mademoiselle de Garay, the curé is still in the confessional? Yes, mademoiselle. It is not yet 11 o'clock when he comes out to teach his catechism class. Well, I will join him there. Seems the only place where his old friends can see the poor man's face these days. Oh, the cross he bears, mademoiselle, is unbelievable. He gets up every morning between one and two, never later than two. Then he goes to unlock the church door, and there are always people already outside the church waiting. Many people? Sometimes as many as 40 or 50 people are waiting for him. First, he hears only the confessions of the women until time for mass. After that, he hears only the men's confessions until 11 o'clock. When does the curé eat breakfast? He never eats breakfast, mademoiselle. And unless he has special guests, all he ever has for lunch is practically nothing. A glass of milk and a cold boiled potato. After lunch, what do you think the curé does? What? He hears more confessions. Except when he has to go on sick calls or other such parochial duties. How late does the curé hear confessions? Often as late as midnight. But that means he rarely gets more than four hours sleep. The curé thinks four hours sleep is time wasted. There were other duties the curé of R did not neglect, such as supplying food for the Providence Almshouse and School for Girls which he founded. Father John, it is good to see you. Mademoiselle, I have come begging again. 
Is it for your Providence Asylum? You need money to buy grain for the children? No, the money is for another charity. Praise be to God, we have enough grain for the children's bread for a considerable time to come. But how can that be? Only last week, the girl at the granary told me there was only a little grain left. Now you have enough grain for months. How can that be? God is good. You must have asked God to work a miracle. You are truly a saint, Father John. Oh, now, do not say that. St. Francis Regis is the one who really worked the miracle. All I did was put his medal at the bottom of the last heap of grain. Father, I talked to the girl at the granary. The girl says that after you prayed to God for help in obtaining food for the school, she went to the granary. She found the granary more full than ever before. Now, please, let us talk of more important matters. The curé of R could never see himself as having any special importance or value in God's eyes. The religious honors that came to him made him feel uneasy. Material honors he rejected. Well, what is in this box, Monsieur Le Maire? A, a relic, I hope? <laughs> it's not a relic, Monsieur le Curé. Well, then I do not need it. Oh, it's a great honor, Monsieur le Curé. You must accept it. You know how I feel about honors, Monsieur Le Maire. Now, please take it away. It's the Medal of the Legion of Honor. His Majesty Napoleon III himself sent it to you. Oh, I do not know why Napoleon should send me a medal unless he wants to reward me for deserting from the French army. I never knew you served in the French army, Monsieur le Curé. I was drafted when I was in the seminary by the first Napoleon. A and you deserted? I was conscripted for Napoleon's Spanish campaign, but I fell ill in the barracks. My regiment left for the Pyrenees Mountains, leaving orders for me to follow after as soon as I recovered. But you deserted. After I got out of my sick bed, I did follow after my regiment. But I got lost in the Pyrenees foothills. At the time, I felt depressed, but I know now that when I thought I was most hopelessly lost, I was really on the road to being found by God. That was when you decided to desert the army? No, no, not, not, not just then. I landed in a district where Napoleon and his Spanish war were both quite unpopular. And the district needed a schoolteacher. When the mayor learned that I was a former seminarian, he pleaded with me to desert the soldier's bayonet for the teacher's baton. And that was when I decided to desert the French armor. But desertion is a shooting offense. Weren't you afraid of getting caught? Once I was hiding in a haystack when I felt a soldier's probing bayonet barely touch my heart. Three inches deeper and uh, I would have died. Oh, how did you feel at that moment, Monsieur le Curé? God suddenly gave me the peaceful, strengthening feeling that it is better to be killed than to kill. You, you weren't afraid to die? I was not afraid of death so much as I was of appearing before God so empty-handed. Empty-handed? Yes. I kept asking myself, what good have I done? What souls have I won for God? And those questions were like sharp thorns in my brain. I felt as if my inactivity for God was a form of treachery, a betrayal of both God and my fellow man. It seemed as if every person in the world was also like me, always hiding from death and judgment. I, I couldn't help thinking that every human heart, in a way similar to my own narrow escape, was only three inches away from death's fatal bayonet point, in one form or another. <sighs> a frightening thought, Monsieur le Curé, but true. And I suddenly realized that it was not by accident that the bayonet point had failed to penetrate my heart when I was hiding in that haystack. I knew that only God's hand had held back the bayonet. Why had God saved me? I kept asking myself. Why? I think God had work to be done, which only you could do, Monsieur le Curé. No, 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 no. It was only because God wanted to prove to all men that his grace and his mercy are sufficient for salvation. Well, that is true, but why should God choose you of all men to prove this? Well, do you not see that if I, the lowliest and most foolish of men, can become a worthy tool of salvation for other men, how great and irresistible must be the divine yeast fermenting in 
in my dull clay, if I, unworthy and despicable, as I know myself to be, can be turned by God's grace into a vessel of salvation for others, what hope there is for the world? What reasonable hopes for salvation the most wicked or the most lazy person can have? Merely by seeing what such a worthless being as I, John Vianney, has done. Just by consenting to let myself become God's tool.